ഫ <laughs> about Islam, to learn about our responsibilities, to learn to defend our freedom as American citizens, to practice our religion as we believe, and also to understand our Sharia of Islam, about which a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misunderstandings are being spread out there. So it's our responsibility as Muslims and also as our non-Muslim fellow American citizens that we truly understand what Sharia really means and to remove the myths and the misunderstandings which are around it. Because when there are misunderstandings, when there is a false information that leads to hateful attitudes, leads to discrimination, and leads to attitudes which are not, which are reprehensible and so in this presentation i'll share with you the information from the original sources of islam islamic guidance which is quran and sunnah example of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to understand what sharia really means the ayah recited before you from surah al-jasiya The chapter 45 verse 18 of the holy quran allah the almighty says o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then we gave you a sharia in religion follow it and do not follow the lust of those who do not know so therefore from this verse we know that the sharia as we'll explain what sharia means is a divine guidance from god almighty allah to the muslims through the agency of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we are commanded to follow this in our everyday life and not to follow any any other desires or guidance now what is the meaning of sharia the root meaning of this sharia the word sharia has been derived from the word shar'a in arabic language and that means a way that leads to main water source or a path to be followed or a source of water water drinking place but in the islamic terminology the sharia means the guidance that god almighty allah the most high has provided the muslims and all the human beings through the quran and sunnah example of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding the beliefs the worships the daily affairs the manners ethics and all areas of life so it's a comprehensive guidance in all matters of life which concern the human beings and this is this guidance is provided to organize their relationship with almighty god allah and also amongst themselves and the purpose is to achieve peace and happiness in this life and the hereafter this concept is not something new this has this is we find in all the major world religions like in judaism we find halakha or hagada 
and they, comp they comprise of the norms by which individuals who, who have Jewish faith, they are governed. Similarly, the canon law is a body of law that applies to certain sects of Christianity, like Catholicism and Episcopal Church. Similarly, in the Sikh religion, there is the Granth, which provides them the guidance for everyday life. The United Methodist Book of Church Law is another example. And similarly, the Jewish Talmud is an example. So this is common in the world religions, that there is a body of laws and regulations and a guidance for everyday life. And in Islam, we have Sharia. The scope of Sharia is, is very wide. It is all embracing and encompassing personal as well as collective spheres in a daily living. It includes entire sweep of life, which includes the ibadat, the worships, the, the zakat, a charity, fasting, pilgrimage, the moral values, the economic endeavors, the political conduct, and the social behavior, including caring for one another, caring for our parents, the neighbors, and maintaining kinship. So the Sharia is not just a body of certain strict laws. It is a comprehensive guidance which relates to every aspect of a human life. But when we look at the guidance, we find out that a large majority of the guidance is related to the worship, the rituals of worship, the prayer, the charity, and the pilgrimage, and our uh, other acts related to the worship. Then a 25% related to personal, family, and economic laws. And only 5%, a very small percentage, relates to the penal system. And so these are the three main components of the Sharia law. One is ahkam al-amaliyya, the practical guidelines related to sayings of individuals, actions of individuals and families, and fiqh. And then al ahkam al the sanctions related to beliefs, and al ahkam al the sanctions related to morals and ethics and akhlaq. Now, where do we get this guidance? What are the main sources of guidance in Sharia? And the four are the main sources of guidance in Islamic Sharia. One and the most important is the Quran at the book of God Almighty Allah, which we believe is the speech of Allah Almighty God to mankind. Second, the Sunnah. Sunnah is the example of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what he said, what he did, and what he approved. And then there is Ijma. Ijma is the consensus of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, the scholars of the early times and the present day. And then there's a qiyas, which is analogy, deduction of the ahkam or commands from the other sources. There are secondary sources, istihsan, istishab, masale mursala, and sadd zarai which I will not go in detail of that. But let's focus upon the primary sources of the guidance in Sharia. Al-Quran is a fundamental and the main source of Islamic law from which all other sources derive their authority. It is the book which has been revealed by, Prophet, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our God Almighty, to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Arabic language, transmitted to us through continuous testimony or tawato. It has been, it has been passed on to us in its original form without any change or addition or deletion. It consists, as we believe, as the word of God Almighty, Allah, the Most High. It revealed to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in 23 years, and it is divine origin. It has no human uh, endeavors in there. It addresses all mankind without distinction of race, religion, or time and it seeks to guide the mankind in all aspects of life. 
The second important source of Sharia is the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It literally means a way or a rule or manner of acting. Technically, Sunnah means the authentic relation or the report about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about three things. One, his qawl or the sayings. Second, his amal or his actions. And the third, the taqreer are his tacit approvals. These three things make the sunnah. The hadith literally means communication or conversation. But technically hadith is the, again, de deeds, sayings, approval, and the sifat are the, uh, the, the uh, qualities and characteristics of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as they have been reported and passed on to us with authentic reporting. The Quran and the Sunnah, they are the main sources of the Sharia. And this ayah from Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah number 49, verse 1, establishes the authenticity and authority of Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya ayyuhal lazeena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yadi illahi wa rasoolih wa attaqullah inna Allah sami'un alim. O oh, you believe, put not yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But be conscious of and fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah is He who hears and knows all things. So therefore the Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes precedence over everything and are the main sources of our guidance or Sharia. Then Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about these two sources. He said, وَقَدْ تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِنِ اعْتَصَمْتُمْ بِهِ فَلَنْ تَضِلُّوا عَبَدًا أَمْرًا بَيِّنًا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةَ رَسُولِهِ I leave behind you for clarifying in your affairs. Whosoever holds fast to them shall never be laid astray. And these are the book of Allah, the Quran, and the Sunnah, the way and the tradition of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was, these were his words from his last khutbah, Hajjatul Vidab, and his last pilgrimage. He was giving a, his sermon. He said, hold fast to Quran and my sunnah. You will never go wrong. The ijma'a is the third source of the sharia. is a consensus of opinion among the jurists on the issues and rulings. Literally, it means to determine, to agree upon. But technically, it is the consensus of mujtahids or the jurists from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after he passed away in a determined period of time upon a rule of Islamic law. The qiyas is the analogical deduction when the scholars they deduce certain guidelines or the rules from the existing sources, Quran, Sunnah, and Ijma'ah. Now let us just, for a moment, think about the comparison between the Sharia, the Islamic guidelines, and the man-made laws. The Islamic law, the Sharia, is derived from Quran and Sunnah example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the man-made laws, they depend upon traditions, customs, experiences, the precedence of the judges and so on. The Islamic law is the law given by God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and on man-made laws is made by the men or the collection of or the bodies of men. In Islamic law, the fundamental principles, they remain unchanged. The in the branches and the details, there is flexibility depending upon the needs of the society. But the man-made laws, they always evolving and changing depending upon the opinions of the individuals, of the bodies. One thing is permissible today, it may be not permissible tomorrow. Then the creation of the Islamic law takes precedence over the formation of society. The law is given by Almighty God and then when the society is formed, it is to follow that. But it is the opposite of the man-made laws. In a society, it has certain needs and they then 
resort to some legislation. The Islamic law covers the present, past, and the future, but the man-made laws only cover maybe the present and the past, but not the future as they don't know about it. The Islamic law is extensive and comprehensive coverage of human conduct. It encompasses the rituals and therefore it also covers the, the hereafter and this worldly life. But the man-made laws are mostly secular laws they relate to this material life. Then there is another terminology in Islam called fiqh. And fiqh is the jurisprudence and it's a product of understanding of the source of Sharia and it is humanly acquired. Now let us go back to the further explanation and understanding of Sharia. The rulings which are related to Sharia, they have five categories. First is the wajib or the obligatory. There are certain commandments which are must and there is no excuse except when there is some situation like somebody is sick, somebody is traveling, some exception can be given, like in salat, like in fasting and so on. Then there is a mandub, which is voluntary. Then there's mubah, or permissible. Makruh, which is disliked. And haram, which is forbidden. So these are the five categories related to the Sharia guidance. Now, what are the objectives of the Sharia, maqasid of the Sharia? This is very important to understand that this guidance which Allah Almighty God has given to us, it has certain positive objectives to achieve in this life and also in the hereafter. The main objective is that it is a mercy. It is a source of mercy and peace for the mankind. When it is followed, when it is understood, and we implement it in our lives, individuals, in our families, in our societies. It leads to peace, it leads to mercy and kindness in the, in the families, in the society, and ultimately salvation in this world and the hereafter, and a success. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the Islamic guidance. It says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we sent you not but as a mercy for all the mankind and jinns and everything else which exists. There are three categories of the maqasid or the objectives of the Sharia. One is called the ruriyat or the essentials, most essential related to the human life. The, the Sharia protects that and safeguards those essentials of a human life. The second is the complementary rahajiyat, the things which uh, may require certain guidelines at certain levels, some concessions. The third is the tahsiniyat, are the things which create beauty in individual life and the society. Now let's reflect upon these for a moment and then we understand truly the objectives and the purpose of the Sharia. ad daruriyat are the essentials which are basically the human rights in the modern terminology. Islam has described these human rights 1433 years ago and declared the guarantee of these human rights. These are the essential matters on which the worldly affair of the people depend. Their neglect leads to total disruption and disorder in the human societies. And these are the five fundamental human rights of daruriyat. And first and the foremost is protection of the deen, of the faith of every individual. They have a right to choose their faith. Nobody can coerce, nobody can force an individual to have a certain faith or certain religion. Islam has guaranteed in its societies to choose whichever way they want to choose. And we know in the Islamic history that in the Islamic state and societies, the Christians or the Jewish people or the people of other faith, Hindus, they enjoyed freedom for their religion, 
they enjoyed the freedom to establish their, their churches and synagogues and they were protected under Islamic law because Islam guarantees the freedom of faith and religion. Second, the protection of life or nafs. Third, the protection of dignity or al-ird. And fourth, the protection of intellect or al-aql. And the fifth is protection of property or al-mal. Now let's reflect a little bit upon these fundamental human rights as Islam has guaranteed the freedom of these rights. First is the religion. It is the most important value that must be protected in an Islam, in Islamic state, Islamic society. Protection of deen at personal level is achieved through ibadat, observance of ibadah. So we are to protect as Muslim of religion. Once we declare shahada, it doesn't mean now that that uh, you are free to just go on and your own ways and you are not to protect and enhance your commitment to your religion. So for that purpose, Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made salat five times a day obligatory upon us because this helps us to protect our religion. This helps us to enhance our relation with God Almighty Allah and protect us against our enemy, the, shait the shaitan or the devil. This increases the Iman and provides a shield, a protection to us against our enemy, the shait shaitan. Then the protection of the nafs or life is obligatory upon each and every individual and the societies to protect the human life. That's why in Islamic societies, the capital punishment for murder is established to deter anyone from harming or hurting an individual are taking their life. That's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِسَاسِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ There is a saving of life for you in Al-Qisas, which is the law of equality in punishment, or men of understanding, that you may become Al-Muttaqeen, the pious people. So this death penalty is also a way in Islamic society is to protect the human life. But this is guaranteed and no one has, is permitted to take an innocent human life. In Surah Al-Maidah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to take one human life, an innocent person's life, is such a heinous crime. It is just like you kill all the human race. And to save one human life, it is just like you save the lives of all the humanity on this planet. The third is the protection of dignity, al-ird. Al the ird are the dignity of every human being is guaranteed in Islam. And as Muslim, we are to respect and honor every human being regarding his, himself as a person, his family, his lineage, we are to respect and honor that. And nobody should be accused falsely, and that's why there is law against a false accusation of those who are innocent people. So dignity or the honor of individual is to be respected. And then protection of intellect or aql. It's the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the aql, uh, the intellect. It differentiates the human being from the animals. And we are to utilize it for the benefit of all the mankind. In Islam, the intellect, or the intelligence, or the knowledge is promoted and the freedom of expression is guaranteed and it is encouraged to have different opinion and have dialogue and debate. It is not to be oppressed. There, there should not be any kind of, a, uh, any kind of limitation on that in a society this to be encouraged. And then there is the protection of property or mal. This is the right of individual to have their property, whether it is tangible or intangible property, the, it, but it is to be acquired in a lawful means. And that's where Allah says in the Quran, eat up not one another's property unjustly nor give bribery to the rulers that you may knowingly eat up a part of the property of others sinfully. 
So we are to acquire in a halal or a justified manner, and this is the right of individuals and right of the families to have their property and have inheritance and pass on their personal property to others. And therefore, all those means which are used to acquire property unlawfully, illegally, or in a haram manner are forbidden. Like the transaction based upon riba is forbidden. Cheating in transaction is forbidden. And to break the trust and promise is forbidden. Stealing is a crime and criminal proceedings are to be uh, taken in a court of law against those who, who break these laws. So these were the five essentials of human, uh, human life are the basic human rights and Sharia protects that. And through that, it brings about peace and harmony in the individual's life, in the families and the societies at large. The next category is hajiyat, are the concessions for human needs. So Islam, the Sharia recognizes that there be special circumstances for individuals and families. And so it gives concessions. Like for example, when somebody is sick or is traveling, then they are given concession in their prayer. They are given concession in their fasting. They can combine their prayer. They can skip their prayer and then make it up later and so on and so forth. So these are the concessions which Islam provides. And this is the mercy of Allah Almighty God that the Sharia is not that strict that for circumstances, situations, it gives you certain concessions. Then third part of the maqasid of Sharia is tahsiniyat, our perfection in conduct. It leads to improvement and beauty in our day-to-day -day life. It involves, for example, instruction regarding cleanliness, the moral virtue, avoiding extravagance, and uh, when there is no tahsiniyat, in the society, in our individual life, then the life becomes difficult. There are two categories of the tahsiniyat. One is makarim al-akhlaq, the excellent morals. The Islam, including Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they emphasize upon Muslims to have the best moral conduct. And that's why the Quran calls the conduct of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the best. It says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَزِيمٍ O Prophet of Allah, you are on the exalted standard of character and conduct, and we are to follow his example. The second category is muhasin al adah or the adornment of customs. And in that, this verse from the Qur'an, Surah An-Nahl, verse number 90, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes some of the muhasin of adat, the adornment of the customs, our day-to-day -day life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli bil ihsan wa itai dil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkar wal baghd ya'azukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands justice, doing of good, giving to the kith and kin their dues and he forbids all shameful deeds, injustice and rebellion. He instructs you that you may receive admonition. So these are six important instructions given to us and they guide us in, in, in a beautiful conduct in our individual life, in our families and societies. So coming to the conclusion, Sharia is based upon the wisdom or hikmah which Allah Almighty God has given to us to Quran and through the Sunnah example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In achieving people's good and welfare and success, its purpose is for the human beings to succeed in this life and the hereafter. And Sharia is all about justice, mercy, peace, wisdom, and good. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, a great scholar of the earlier time, he said, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with its opposite, or zulm, common good with mischief, Wisdom with nonsense is a ruling that does not belong to Sharia. So in, in summary then, Sharia is a comprehensive guidance from God Almighty Allah to all mankind, and particularly to the Muslims, to guide their individual life, their family life, their so social life, in order to achieve peace, harmony, 
mercy and to achieve the wisdom which Allah Almighty God gives to the mankind and to have peaceful relation amongst them to be successful in this life and the hereafter. Last but not the least, I like to remind myself and all who are here that knowing what Sharia is, knowing what its purpose and maqasid are, what is our role as Muslims? First, we must continue to study and understand the Sharia. This is not the job of scholars only. Every Muslim must understand that, must study that, and should know its, its meaning, its sources, and its purpose. And then they must guide dialogue efforts between Muslims and our fellow non-Muslim American brethren at the national, international level for better mutual understanding and respect for each other and not to develop misunderstandings which leads to hatred, which leads to discrimination and leads to limitation of their freedom of religion. The highlighting the examples and supporting the Muslim American organization like Ikna and Mass who are promoting religious tolerance, pluralism, democracy, gender equality, and community service will marginalize the extremists that work against the U.S. interests. So this is what we ought to do, these three points I want to share with you, to understand the Sharia and to implement in our lives, and then must enter into dialogue with our fellow non-Muslim Americans, brethren, and then highlight the example and support the efforts of the organizations like ICNA and MASS who are working towards better understanding of Sharia and struggling to maintain our, our constitutional freedoms here in the United States. So thank you very much for your attention. Jazakallah kullu khair.